Thank you, Matt. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming today. And thank you to the organizers of UX New Zealand and for having me here. I'm actually really excited to be here. And thank you for my new cardigan. <laughs> Very nice. And Sean, I'm really happy that you made this presentation before me because now it's fresh in your minds, and this can be like a continuation. Uh, just keep some of the things that he has been talking about because some of the things that I'm going to talk about, uh, they give some close relation. So this was uh, actually going to be a joint presentation. Unfortunately, my colleague Karina couldn't join me, join me on the stage today. Uh, so I'm afraid that you will have to be a stack here with me and dealing with my accent for 30 minutes. Bear with me. Uh, it's actually exo exotic. <laughs> so for, for what I heard before, I think a lot of us, we share the same problem. I struggle a lot trying to explain <laughs> what I do. When people ask me, what do you do for a living? I really wish it would be this easy. <laughs> uh, but it's not. I, usually, probably, we are dealing with the same, the same issue, right? Uh, somebody asks you, what do you do? And then you start saying, well, you know, we try to make uh, analyze uh, services and products. We try to make the process smoother and delightful for, for users. And then you, you quote a couple of examples like, uh, you know, Uber, there's a UX designer behind. Uh, you know, Airbnb, there's a UX designer behind. The thing is pretty much under control. What I have a problem with is the follow-up question. <laughs> and usually it's a, yeah, cool, I think I get it. Uh, so which type of product are you working on? And then I said, in, in augmented reality. So, what? Oh, yeah, well, more precisely, uh, we use image recognition, deep learning, and contextual information to display relevant content in augmented reality. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I keep on falling in the same mistake of the buzzwords. I, I put myself in the same trap. But I, I must admit that it makes for a really good uh, small talk at family reunions. And it, it made me think a lot on what it means being a designer in, in this space, in, in emerging tech. So here's the topic of the talk, the design for emerging technologies. Or may I say, how do we design for emerging technologies? Because I, I want to share my story with you. I want to tell you about my experience on working on the air space and the challenges that we faced and how we solved it and the things that we didn't solve yet. So let's start with the more emerging technologies. The emerging technologies are those that are perceived to have the capability of changing this, this status quo. They're generally new, but they might be some old technologies as well that are still emerging because they are in the develop or they are somehow controversial. Often technologies that require a trigger, a trigger event, uh, either in industry, social, in technology, socioeconomics, to reach mainstream adoption. So you see, for example, that virtual reality is pretty much ahead of augmented reality right now, that mostly because of its feasibility. Because we had electric cars before. Just look at this baby, 1912, and it could run 40 miles with a charge. The electric car was buried for years. In fact, there's a documentary that's called Who Killed the Electric Car? And then in the latest recession, we, the, we started to analyze our dependency from fuel and from oil, and they brought it back to the, to the picture. Hybrid cars came, and Tesla made them an object of desire. We have smartphones, too. I used to work for Nokia, and we used to call these portable computers. They still have one of those. Multitouch was what made the, smartphone, the smartphones less threatening. This thing was quite intimidating. And the App Store made them useful. Before there were apps, but there were these Java apps that you were sideloading. Most, most of the times, it wasn't worth the effort. We had a VR, too, before, uh, before Google Cardboard, before Oculus. This was Sega VR. It wasn't released because it was too expensive, too expensive the device and too expensive to produce games. So yeah, the time for VR is, is now, because this thing is $10. So besides feeling terribly old right now by showing you all these devices, 
I design for AR, I want to tell you that I design AR products, and AR has been around for about 60 years, 60, 65 years. When I tell people that I design AR products, this is what I would like to think that they envision my job. <laughs> but in, in reality, it's something more like this. I know, it's a, it's a bummer. It's not so different to, <laughs> to what er everybody in our discipline does, uh, but it comes with its own set of challenges. Let me tell you a little bit about the company that I work for. Uh, it's called Blipar, it's a startup, and it actually started the business associating itself in uh, marketing and, and advertisement with big brands. It was riding the wave of the wow effect of AR, and it, it did, they did quite well. The mechanism was, was pretty simple. Uh, you have an app, it's called Blipar, and then somebody has uploaded an image into our visual search server, that image is called a bleepable image. And then if somebody scans the image with the bleeper app, we call that bleeping a bleepable image. <laughs> and then they will, they will see an overlay, an augmented reality experience on top of that, that, that can be a 3D animation, it can be a video, it can be a, a mini game, and we call that a blip. So if you bleep a bleepable image, you get a blip. Uh, one thing here, if, if coining terms is as part of your business strategy, you are making life really difficult to designers. Uh, nowadays, we have expanded the, the, the visual recognition of the app, and now it recognizes thousands of daily life objects. That means that we don't rely anymore only in user-generated content. The app can recognize an object, and it can gather some information. It can show you the information about that object, and it can also show you how is it connected to other objects in such a way that you could blip a uh, Red Bull can. It will tell you that the recipe, uh, the original one, was coming from Thailand. And then from Thailand, you can go to Southeast Asia. And then from Southeast Asia, I don't know, you can go to the colonialism, the European colonialism. This is where we are right now. Uh, that is not how we started. And it's probably not where we are going to end up. Uh, working in tech is usually pretty dynamic. Working in emerging tech is, is crazily fast. Things change a lot and it's full of unknowns. When you move in an ambiguous new domain, uh, there's limited research you can rely on. There's not much market, market research that you can, uh, that you can uh, get data from mostly because the market is still yet to be opened. There's limited competitive analysis, probably because you're the, fir the first one in the, in the space, or your competitors are struggling with the same thing as you do, so probably they're even looking at you. So my first steps into augmented reality were, were actually exploring the space. I experimented in, with what was possible with the, with the technology, how was it perceived, uh, the unique characteristics of interacting in, uh, in mixed reality. And I use media art as my playground, uh, exploring augmented reality and natural user interfaces in interactive installations. So this installation was called uh, the Yavu, and it explored the idea of multipresence. So it was simulating CCTV uh, camera recordings, so the viewer could feel like he was at the same time in different rooms simultaneously. This other one, uh, I call it your selfie, uh, had a more utilitarian approach. It was developed uh, with Razorfish in, in Sydney. It was a prototype to explore the idea of magic mirrors. Uh, imagine you're living in a super connected house and then somebody can send you an image and the image is being pulled on your wall and you can include yourself in the image, spike a pose and send it back. With this uh, experiment, uh, what I learned is uh, first that this sort of magic mirror, this uh, call it projected augmented reality, is, is interesting, but it's not as powerful as a first person experience. And the second one is, uh, is this, this is trying to emulate a, a UI on the 3D space when you're working with gestures on a 3D space, is physically straining. So when you're talking about the yard, a lot of times it comes to your mind, this minority report, image with the Tom Cruise move everything around. Uh, 
tell you what, if he would be working seven hours a day doing that thing, he would have the shoulders of a bodybuilder. Uh, to get started, to get in inspired uh, with a new technology, science fiction is actually a good resource. And, and you can tell from my slides that I love science, fi science fiction. Uh, uh, classic works like uh, Asimov or pop uh, culture, TV shows or, or films like uh, Star Trek, Logan's Run, Back to the Future, they can give you an idea of humanity's dreams. And it can help you see if some of, the, of those dreams have been fulfilled already with the current tech. So if you just look at the Star Trek, for example, tablet computers, check. Uh, video calling, check. And with virtual reality, actually we are going to have some sort of teleportation. So let's do a semi-check there. Science fiction inspiration can be quite powerful. Uh, Layer, that was one of the pioneers in the consumer augmented reality, uh, was founded based in two fiction works. One was uh, one anime that was called Den no Koiru, and the other one was a novel called uh, Rainbow Sam. Let's not be afraid to use our imagination and to put on the table the most ridiculous of ideas, uh, because they can give some surpri surprising results. Let me tell you a story about the foundation of Blipart, the, the company that I, that I work for. Our CEO, Rich, uh, he likes to, to tell a story about how him and his mates, they were spending some time in a pub, they were having some pints in England. And then the last round, the bill amounted to something like 15 pounds, and they paid with a 20 pounds bill. The waiter was taking some time to bring the change back. So one of them made a joke say like, uh, well, could you imagine if the Queen of England could step, stand, uh, step out of the 20 pounds bill and say, hey, I want my five pounds back. And Omar, that was uh, at this time his co-worker and now is a co-founder and the CEO of the company has a strange sense of humor and the day after he came back with the first prototype of, uh, of Libar. At that point he said like, ah, I can do it, and he did it. What I'm getting to here is exploring the space is you have to be open. You have to be observant to the past, present, and um, even fictional behaviors. You don't have to limit yourself to current tech, because probably tech is going to be faster, more faster than you when you are thinking about solutions. Think about, about what is going to be available in the future. So as an example right now, or before, we were working with image recognition, and now we are doing visual browsing, and the next step maybe could be face recognition, and after that, Maybe the technology is going to enable us to be able to recognize the environment. And even after that, once you know that I'm in this room, I could be able to display some augmented reality content on top of it, mapping it. And even after that, that content could be dynamically generated and being tailored depending on your situation and your context. So, we have been playing, we have been exploring, uh, we have used our fantasy, our imagination, but now it comes, there comes reality, reality strikes. And this is the major question we ask. What is this for? It can be very tempting to let it be technology driven. Uh, develop something that is technically sophisticated, really easy, and see what happens. Often we find ourselves reverse engineering a use case for the technology we work with. This becomes even more complex when uh, you are putting, trying to create a business case into the equation, especially if you work for a startup, the pressure to start generating revenue, it can make you, it can push you to make up a fictional use case just to justify the use of your tech to investors. This, this is not only delusional and it doesn't work at the long, on the long run, it's actually pretty dangerous. Let me steal this slide from uh, Mike Mon Montero's talk. Uh, it's, it's one of my favorite talks, uh, how, de how designers destroy the world. If you didn't watch it, do it. On his style, he makes you feel like shit at the beginning of the, <laughs> at the, beginning of the presentation, and then he pulls you up and makes you feel courageous about what you're doing. Um, this quote has been resonating in my head a lot of what I do. I'm not, get, no, not want to get too dramatic here, but uh, we are creating a future. 
And we as designers, we have the responsibility of using our skills to create something that solves a real problem, that brings real value, and that benefits people. With unknown user goals, every single step that we make is an assumption. We have to make sure that we are testing and we are validating every single scenario that we come up with. So what is good for AR, you might, might wonder to start. Um, well, if, you, if it's a problem that you cannot solve with a keyboard or with a mouse, uh, maybe it's a good starting point. So you can give it a try. Some years ago, we ran a sp an experiment about uh, user-generated content in, uh, in augmented reality, what could be interesting for people. So we grab a, a bunch of people into our office. We gave them, each one of them, a deck of stickies. And we told them, leave the office now, walk around for an hour, and they start posting a sticky notes on the things that you find interesting, and then write a comment on that. And we walk after them. They were taking us on the steps. They were showing us the comments. And we saw that people were, were using that as a self-expression. It was sort of a, of a really low fidelity graffiti. Some people were placing post-its on top of the post-it that somebody placed before. Based on this, uh, this experiment gave birth to an app called Stick2, uh, called Stick2. And it was sort of an augmented reality graffiti app, and it had a really strong social component. The app was live for a couple of years, and we gathered a lot of information about it, especially in regards of uh, user-generated content and how people interact with each other in the virtual space. With unknowns, we're also in danger of creating fictitious user groups. If I search now in Google Images for augmented reality, that the stock photo comes in. Early adapters are not always teenagers or young professionals that are uber social and hyper connected. More, more often, they are someone who are already good at what they do, but they, they're struggling with the tools that they, they have available. I really like this use case because it's augmented reality. It's not flashy, it's not futuristic, but it solves a problem. It solves a specific problem at the specific point of time. So everything is an assumption. When working with, some, with something new, everybody gets really excited. Imagination flies, uh, everybody comes up with a really crazy ideas. When you are at the ideation stage, you have to canalize those energies and make everybody check with ground control and make sure that we are developing a solution that satisfies uh, a real problem, either present or future. My colleague Karina designed this framework to envision uh, possible future scenarios and to align stakeholders during, uh, during uh, brainstorming sessions. She so has a full presentation on this topic, so I'm not going to get uh, very deep and just talk through it. I think it relates pretty much to, the, to what Phil was talking this, uh, this morning. So probably you are running some workshops like that. So this, this framework, she calls it uh, Four Worlds and a North Star. So what you do, you create a list of possible driving forces based on, on current trends and facts, and you rank them. And from them, you create a, a scenario grid. The driving forces have to be measurable. So in this case, you have a, a concern is economy, and another concern is privacy. So you go, and your grid goes from economic depression to an economic prosperity, and to not share absolutely anything, be concerned about your privacy, or you don't care about your privacy, you share everything. Then you create four possible worlds based on these quadrants. You define them, you describe them, you tell a story about, it, about each one of these, uh, these worlds. And for each world, you come up with a currency. The currency is a, is a prime value for the people in this world. To find this, uh, this value, we can ask questions like, uh, what would you see in this, in this future scenario? What would you see in the, in the news headlines? Or what kind of business would thrive in this, uh, in this world? With these values, we build a, build a prototype for, to satisfy each one of these worlds. And we will have that in mind when we are looking towards our North Star, that is our, our goal for the final product. So we will be coming back and forth as our path, our roadmap changes, and we see that we are leaning towards one world or another, we will be referring to these prototypes. 
So as I said before, um, emerging tech, it has the potential to, ch to change the status quo. Our mission is utilitarian AR, so making an AR uh, new media channel for a screenless future. In order to do so, we have to provide content. And this content has to be useful. In our team in San Francisco, we are working into bringing AR creation to the masses. So we just re released a, a content edition tool. It's a, the beta is still our first iteration. And the main characteristic is being powerful in ass with a really low learning, learning curve. So it's a sort of art prototyping design mixed with a 3D animation and target to PowerPoint users. So the idea is that anyone would be able to create decent quality content so then anyone could use the app and find that content in augmented reality. But this comes with a risk. User-generated user content can become noise. We have, have to find ways to filter this high quality content. Or, and if you remember the days of, uh, of personal websites in the 90s with all these animated GIFs and uh, dancing babies and the dancing hamster, or even the first days of YouTube, uh, opening a new channel to public needs to evolve. And we have to offer mechanisms to help that channel reach maturity. This also brings us to challenge augmented reality itself. itself. What, what does it mean, the virtual content that we want to display in augmented reality? Is, is there something more than animations of 3D or mini games? What about audio? Or what about smells? Or haptic feedback? That's also augmented reality. This app, uh, Wayfinder, uh, was one of the winners of the Interaction Awards this year. And it's a tourist guide of London for blind people. It's all audio and it's guided by, by beacons. This is augmented reality. If there's something that I would like you to, to keep, to take away home uh, of all my chit chat today, is that tech should be a means to an end and not the end. Uh, tech should be serving a goal. And even though when we are work working in emerging technology, the reverse seems to be true. As designers in this domain, we must use different methods to focus on finding a strong use case. Our goal is creating something useful that will influence people's behavior and create the habit of use. Only in this way is where we can move augmented reality farther in the hype curve that I was showing you at the beginning. So we are ready to build the future. The greatest potential impact that we have is the new things that we are generating with our, our new creation. As designers, we have to be responsible of the impact of our creations. A lot of them we, we cannot anticipate, and there will be a lot, of, uh, a lot of side uses that might appear. And that's great. That's, that's actually the beauty of it. But we have to be aware of that and aware that we are introducing a change that we might be changing society. We have seen what a dystopian future looks like. Uh, we have watched apocalyptic movies, and it's horrifying what might expect to us. I mean, terrible, horrifying. <laughs> Let's face it, along our path, we'll find some dilemmas that might even make us doubt of the purpose of our mission. Uh, I have some, some colleagues that they decided not to go on into this because they didn't believe that it was a future they want, wanted to live then. Uh, you're designing for the future, and that could be a utopian paradise, or it could be a dystopian, big brother, uh, apocalyptic world. I believe that uh, I'm in a fortunate position to be working on this because I, I can try to fight to, to use my values to, to create a future that I, that I believe is a future that is worth living for. But you have to be aware of, of concerns. You have to be uh, aware of, of the dangers of it. One of the biggest concerns is privacy. Uh, how much privacy are we giving away? We are already giving away a lot of privacy. How much of our reality is going to be hijacked by corporations just injecting their marketing messages directly into our brains? One point to think about that is that privacy is, is always in a state of flux. The definition changes over time. To enjoy the benefits of our new society, we, we have to give up some privacy. It's sort of a necessary evil. But instead of fighting it, 
we can flow with it. Believe me, one day, somebody is going to use their device, maybe at that time it's not going to be mobile devices, point it at your face, and then see information around your face. Sounds scary, but it's very likely that you yourself put that information available online for people to check it. We already do it. We already share a lot of our lives online, so this is a natural next step. Maybe this is going to bring more transparency. Everybody's exposed, so maybe we are not so, not so sensitive to scandals. Maybe privacy will not matter anymore. So our notion of privacy is, is the old model, and it's changing. I see, for example, that my notion of privacy, I'm Spanish, my wife is German, and we have completely different ideas of what it, came, what it means keeping a window, window open or taking your shirt off. And I, my goddaughter, she's 15, she's sharing online much more stuff that I, was, that I would be wishing she could be doing. AR has the potential to be a game changer, to be an enabler, to, to free us from a world of staring at the screens. Uh, it can change social interactions, it can change our urban landscape, it can change politics, uh, fashion and our proper perception, our perception of reality. And he's doing it already. If you notice, and I'm like 20, 25 minutes over a, a presentation about documented reality and I didn't mention Pokemon Go. <laughs> <laughs> That's an achievement. But here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is happening and this really shocking. I was living in Japan for, for about six years and the hikikomori issue is a really big issue. Uh, I, for those, those of you that don't know about that problem, hikikomori are young adults that don't, don't leave the room. And sometimes they even stay in the room with their windows closed. They don't want to interact with any human being at all. They live with their families, they don't go out for lunch. Their families, they leave the food at the door and whenever they hear they are going away, open the door and take the things in. They have been a lot of government programs to try to help these people and, and through psychotherapy. It hasn't been successful. And now it comes this game and these people are hitting the streets. <laughs> they're, they're going out and they're walking the streets and they're playing with each other and they're talking to people. It's, it's amazing. So what years of psychotherapy wasn't able to achieve, one game could do it and the most amazing thing is that it wasn't, it wasn't even intended. It was a side effect. VR and AR is successfully being used in, in the health world as well uh, for, to treat brain therapies for autism, Alzheimer, and to recover for, from traumatic experiences. It's also used to, or can be used to assist medical, to use medical assistance for remote areas. It can be used also to explain children about their, about their diseases. I, I love this one. Uh, it's called Gomo, and it's a toy that uh, medical staff can use to explain illnesses to children and to explain them how the treatment is affecting their body. This is targeted to preschool age children. It's beautiful. So thank you, Sean, so I don't have to talk about this one. <laughs> we have seen what expeditions can do. So if you translate this into the field of education with augmented reality, you could bring it to the new world, to the, to the real world, and you could be walking the street, you could be walking your normal commute route and loading content. Say, well, today I want to learn about uh, architecture. So you load the content of arch architecture, you walk, walk in the street and say, okay, this building is this type, this building is this type, interesting. Tomorrow I want to learn about trees, so I walk, you know, this is this type of tree, this is this type of tree. So every day can be a new learning experience. It can be also used to uh, assist on, um, on technical support and for cheaper training for professionals as well. Or even just imagine having an augmented reality manual so that next time that your car is breaking down, you pull out your tablet and you can see how you have to change the wheel of your car. This was in, the, in London in the, in the fashion show week. I was fantasizing with a friend of mine, just imagine a future in which you're not wearing clothes, and you're not naked like these guys, because it's this cold, uh, but you're, you're wearing a jumpsuit, plain grape jumpsuit, but you decide virtually what you're going to be wearing. And as you are walking the street, people are going to see what you decided, and you can change it on the fly. On the fly. You could maybe change it as, uh, with a timer, as you could be changing the wall wallpaper of your computer, 
or you could even decide which type of outfit, outfit you want to show to which demographic. Why not? And I wonder how would this affect, what could be the impact on fashion and self-expression? How, how the fashion business would work without having to deal with different materials? So summarizing, the talk was about, about emerging technologies, but uh, I think that every, all of this applies to, to everything that we do as, uh, as UX pr practitioners. We have to get inspired, experiment, act with responsibility, because we are building the future, and of us depends that the future that we are building is a future that is worth living in. Machado started a poem with this sentence. To have alert, there's no path. The path is made by walking. And I would add that this is a really exciting path to be walking in. Thank you. <laughs>